Well, good morning and welcome. This morning we're going to do a little bit of an abbreviated service for you. Um, we're going to skip the music and we'll be gathering down at Cutcomb. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity just to hear the message this morning. And so we are actually pre-recording it for you the night before. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to be studying verses 11 through 24, actually verses 10 through 24. And we want to talk about loving at the next level. If you would bow with me in prayer and let's just commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have your word. We, we thank you um, this month of February as we think about Valentine's Day, as we think about your love for us and our love for each other. What an example we have in Christ. And I pray that we would just be able to be immersed in that example, to truly love to the next level and strive to show um, the sacrifice and compassion that you showed to us. Uh, so we just want to give this time to you. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you're our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Our government, through NASA, has spent billions and billions of dollars to try to find signs of life outside of our planet. Several pictures of Mars have caused many conspiracy theories to emerge. One picture showed something that looked like little cannonballs. And so people began to wonder if that was proof of life on Mars. When some of those cannonballs were analyzed, unfortunately, or fortunately, they were only 5 millimeter pebbles made of calcium sulfate. So there was no sign of life. Another picture had people believing that there was a human femur bone discovered on that barren landscape. And, and once again, it was debunked. It was just another weathered rock on Mars. Uh, one quote from CNET.com said, there's also the Mars Bigfoot, the Mars Cannonball, the Mars Spoon, the Mars Warrior Woman, and the Mars Assyrian God. Uh, you know, last year, uh, continuing on, it says, last year a scientist claimed to have identified fossilized insects on Mars. Another claimed to have found mushrooms but there's absolutely no evidence that these images show anything other than weathered rocks. So the search for life continues. As we think about that search for life, this morning I want to celebrate the signs of life inside of our church. Uh, this is the Sunday for our annual meeting. It's why we're having our combined service. And specifically, there's a sign of life inside each heart that has been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that sign of life is sacrificial and compassionate love. In other words, this morning, let's, let's remember this. Loving each other at Christ's level of sacrifice and compassion demonstrates life in Him. So if we say, yeah, on Mars, there's no sign of life. Like we can look and look, but no one has been able to discover a living organism. On the other hand, when we look at the living organism of the church, can we say there is life? When we look at the, the, into our hearts and into our lives, can we say Christ's love is on display? And that is a proof that there is spiritual life inside of me and inside of you. So loving each other at Christ's level and striving for that, that sacrifice and compassion, it demonstrates that we have life in him. You see, 1 John 3, 10 and 11 really set the stage for this. So if you look with me, it says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I want you to understand and see here in this passage that love is a supernatural expression of obedient children of God. Yes, many of us as just created beings who are made in the image of God, we have the capacity to love and to be loved. But this is loving at the supernatural level. So love is an expression of loving at the supernatural level, and it's an expression of obedient children of God. And so... As followers of Christ, when we trust him as Lord and Savior, there's a family connection with other believers that happens. There's a light 
that comes on inside of us and needs nurtured and developed so that it blossoms into this deeply compassionate, sacrificial love that's marked by what Jesus said and did. I think all of us are used to the, the COVID risk dial, right? So clear on the danger zone, we have red and orange, and then it gets to yellow in the middle and then green, and it kind of fades out to where there's not much risk. John, as he dives in in verse 12, he wants to give us um, the danger level on the risk dial. In other words, where we realize that love is this supernatural expression of children of God, we also see that murder and hatred are at the level of the enemy. So here's down here the level of the enemy. Here's the level of Christ. And John says we need to pay attention and notice that murder and hatred are at the level of Satan, at the level of our enemy. And he uses an illustration from the life of Cain and Abel in the Old Testament. So look with me at 1 John 3, and let's pick it up in verse 12. He says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's a heavy set of verses. But we're, we're being told that Cain and Abel help us to understand where we don't want to be. You see, Cain, on the one hand, was a brother to Abel. He was uh, a son to Adam and Eve. In fact, Cain and Abel were the first two children mentioned, born to Adam and Eve. Now, I really enjoy eating at Raising Cain's. And in the instance of the restaurant chain, Cain refers to the founder's dog. But raising Cain is slang for causing trouble, for doing wrong. And dictionary.com stated, it defined it as to create a disturbance. It then gave an example in context, quote, Alan and his buddies were always raising Cain over at the frat house, end quote. And so you get the idea that when somebody's raising Cain, they are doing bad things. They're out to cause that, that reckless behavior, that disturbance. And that lingo comes from the Genesis record. If you want to turn with me back to Genesis chapter 4. So like I said, Cain and Abel were brothers, uh, possibly competitive, as most a lot of brothers are. And they grew up into adulthood. Cain loved to grow crops. He lived off the land. Abel loved the livestock. And so we find in chapter 4 that Cain and Abel one day decide that they are going to bring a sacrifice before the Lord, an offering before the Lord. And so in Genesis 4, verse 3, to give us some background, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So two brothers, they both have this desire to come and present an offering before, before the Lord. And so Cain, because he grows crops, he brings fruits, vegetables. We don't know exactly what, but it was something that he'd grown, and he brings it before the Lord. And Abel, it says that, he brings um, some of his livestock. It says that he, he actually brought uh, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So the emphasis there, Abel gave of the best that he had in heartfelt worship. It might have had something to do with being an animal offering, but what we do know is that God rejected the offering of Cain, but he accepted the offering of Abel. I think the important thing to remember here is that Abel's heart was in the right place. Abel was a true worshiper. Cain was not. In Hebrews 11.4, we have an important cross-reference to this passage. And there it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. 
through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. That is encouraging to me. When we act in faith, when we worship in faith, our actions speak beyond our lifetime. And of course, for Abel, it was in the pages of Scripture. Notice that Abel was acting in a trust toward God. You see, what was on the inside came out in genuine worship. And so, in some way, God accepted Abel's offering. We don't know if it was fire coming down from heaven, but in some visible way, God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain. And so Cain's looking at Abel. God's favoring him, and he gets jealous. He gets envious to the point that he goes out and he kills his brother Abel. And so his jealousy and envy lead to the first murder in the Bible just two generations into the history of mankind. You see, the source of hate to, towards those who are living for God as God's children is jealousy and envy. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. You see, there we read in verse 13, and it's, the question is asked in verse 12, why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the world hates will hate righteous people because of jealousy, because of envy. And that is what we see with Cain and Abel. Trusting Christ brings amazing blessings into our life. When you and I trust Christ, we receive a genuine relationship that brings peace and joy into our lives. We have power over sin. We have victory. We know where we're going to go when we die. And God does have his blessing in our lives, even though it might be suffering, it might be trials, but there are so many blessings to the Christian life. But when we have that, jealousy over what has happened in our lives will be there. In other words, let's think about some scenarios. When a believer shares about a genuine relationship with Christ, it can be offensive to someone who does not feel anything real. When religious actions and going through the motions are not bringing about peace with God. It can be aggravating. It can be frustrating. When a believer gets free from a sinful habit because they have the power of Christ, when two friends can't do what they used to do together, they feel the divide. When a Christian's pure life brings conviction, when sin is lovingly exposed for what it is, there can be hatred. And at this point, we have to ask, will we still love our enemies? Or will we also stoop to hating and resenting in return? You see, that's where this love-obedience thing gets supernatural. Because we're called to love our enemies. We're called to realize, don't be surprised that we as Christians will have enemies. That we will struggle because we know Him as Lord and Savior. You see, at the level... Of hatred and murder, there is zero sign of spiritual life. Look with me at verses 14 and 15. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So at the level of hatred and murder, there's zero sign of spiritual life. God equates hatred and murder. Hatred is murder on the inside, and murder is just carrying out hatred on the outside. Hatred can lead to premeditated stuff or an impulsive uh, outburst of anger. And, and let me just say this. This passage is not teaching that murder is the unpardonable sin. That someone who has committed murder can't go to heaven. Rather... A person with an unrepentant hatred seething beneath the surface or lived out in a pattern of taking human life shows that they belong to Satan, not God. Just like it says in verse 12 that Cain was of the evil one. And so this passage calls us to evaluate the signs of life. Do we know Christ? Because you see, envy, jealousy, Hatred towards others is not the mark of a believer. 
Believers are warned to repent and to forgive and to live in freedom, to process the pain by taking it to Christ. Christ followers have the potential to be hurt the worst by their spiritual family. And we know that those who are closest to us can hurt us the worst. Sometimes we as believers can be tempted toward hard feelings and hatred towards our spiritual family. Maybe a brother or a sister in Christ appears to flaunt their spirituality. And you hear them talk about their deep prayer time and how it was so powerful. And you think, give me a break. Maybe when another Christian is mightily used of God, we think, oh, I just wish that they would fail and come down to my level. You know, I, I know that for me sometimes, I have to ask God just to bless when I see maybe another pastor, another church growing like crazy. Can I be tempted to be jealous? Absolutely. But you see, this supernatural love isn't about taking, it's about giving. Sometimes we might see another Christian have victory in their life or get free from a struggle or or surrender at a new level and we feel like we're being left in the dust and Satan loves to feed that and say, see, you, you need to be bitter at that. See, that person is not really your friend. And what God means for good, Satan wants to divide. And so we see in this passage that Murder and hatred are at the level of the enemy. Unbelievers are warned here that if the sign of spiritual life isn't there, we need to call on Jesus to save us. You see, Cain gives us a portrait of a fake worshiper. He looked religious, but he knew in his heart that he was not accepted by God because he didn't have faith. Now, let's learn something from Cain. In the book of Genesis, Cain actually has a conversation with God. So Cain brings his sacrifice. He knows God exists. He saw Abel's sacrifice get accepted. Cain believed in God's existence. He even communicated and he even heard God speak, but he didn't have the faith to surrender and follow. The point is that loving each other at Christ's level of sacrifice and compassion demonstrates life in him. Cain didn't have that life, and it led to that hatred. Abel did. So we need to move on. And I want us to see next that we are called to rise above, not just the level of murder and hatred, but as the body of Christ, we're called to rise above the level of indifference. Look at verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In other words, We see someone who has a desperate need. We see that the lights are about to go out. We see that um, maybe there's a physical illness. There's a real need. And we just turn away and we say, well, I, I hope it gets taken care of. That's indifference. That's turning a blind eye. And, and John says, we need to rise above that level of indifference. You see, indifference might be moving towards the yellow on the risk dial. It might not be hatred. It might not be murderous thoughts. But it's still not the love of compassion and sacrifice. And you see, maybe right here in our, in our community, there's needs that God wants us to discover, but especially among the body of Christ that we need to be looking to support one another. Because the the last thing that we need to look at this morning is that we're called to embrace the love level of sacrifice and compassion. That this takes us up to the example of Christ. Look at verse 16. By this we know love, that He, that's Christ, laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, for our brothers and sisters. He goes on there again in verse 14. We'll read it one more time. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In other words, let's be real. Let's be real about serving others out of our relationship 
with Christ, to follow Christ's example. I believe that this prepares our hearts for communion. I believe this is the heart of the gospel, that Jesus laid down his life for us, that he gave up his spirit, his life blood, bios in the Greek, the most precious gift that could be given so that we could have eternal life, the Zoe life, the spirit life. You see, we are called to embrace Christ's example of sacrifice and compassion. Jesus didn't talk, just talk about our problem. He did something about it. He was grace. He was truth. He was action. And so I think about the phone calls that we might need to make to people who are sick, who are struggling, discovering needs, invitations to gather with those who might be outside of our circle, that we would lay down our lives, lay down our stepping stones, lay down some of our dreams to help bring about the dreams of others. So we are to respond with deeds and truth. I love seeing pictures of planet Earth from space. And even from that panoramic view, as you look down on planet Earth, you can see signs of life. There is green and there is the blue water and no planet that has yet to be discovered or has been discovered in the galaxy has those signs of life. There is one spot and it is where we live. Mars, not so much. When people look at Sandhills Church of Hope or whatever church you are a part of, do they see signs of life? Do they see active love in action at at the level striving for the sacrifice and compassion of Christ? As I examine my own life, as we examine our lives, do we observe the supernatural life of Christ helping us to overcome the hatred and resentment in laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters? Have we been thinking about others? Have we been engaging others? Or have we been pulling back? Have we been buying into the resentment and feeding the lies of the enemy that says your brother or sister doesn't really care about you? They just care about themselves. Has disunity been pulling us away? Or has love been bringing us together? Do we see God replacing indifference with compassion to do something, to get involved? It's a joy to see all of you as the body of Christ ministering to each other. And I want to just encourage us this morning, let's keep striving to love at the next level. Let's not let anything lower than that, indifference, hatred in our hearts, come between. Let's continue to strive to love as Christ who gave himself for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time once again that we've had in your word and that we can can take your word and we can apply it to our lives and we can look for signs of life, signs that we've become new, signs that we've uh, become your children. And so, Lord, this morning if we look and we realize we're more like Cain than Abel, maybe we realize that we've got the fake worship thing going on Maybe we realize that in our heart we know we're not connected with you and it makes us bitter and it makes us angry and we don't sense love towards other followers of you. Lord, help us, I pray. I just pray that anyone who would feel that in their heart right now, that they would allow that conviction to lead them to the cross. Lord Jesus, stir in their hearts and allow them to see their need of you. To not be judged in the future, but to realize that now you're crying out to them to receive a supernatural love that will change their life forever. And Lord, for those that know you, Lord, help us to never forget the example of our Savior. That when it's hard and when we do have feelings of anger, when we do have feelings of bitterness, when we do sense that jealousy and envy is stirring in our heart towards a brother or sister, that Lord, we would choose the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we would abide in love and that we would be givers and not takers and that there would be abundant signs of life in our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thanks a lot for being a part of uh, this online service this morning, and I just pray God's blessing and pray that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would abound in hope. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks.